If you've been tracking with us in the Gospel of Mark, um, we are coming down to some really heavy-duty things at the end of Jesus' journey on the earth as he faces his own death, his arrest and trial, <clears throat> and we'll be moving into that pretty quickly. <clears throat> if you brought a Bible and you want to follow along on our, in our passage today, uh, please take it out. We'll, we'll be in Mark chapter 14 for a little bit. <clears throat> and here's the question for us today, really. Uh, do we openly identify with Jesus when we're around unbelievers, or do we try to hide that fact? That's the question. That's the challenge, really, today, as we look at Peter's denial of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. Now, <clears throat> Mark does one of his little uh, rhetorical things, and so to see the context of Peter's denial, I have to jump around a bit, a bit in Mark 14. It'll make sense in a minute. But let's start, if you're following along, I'm going to read Mark 14, beginning in Mark 14, 26 to 31. This is right after the Passover. They sang a hymn, went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all these may yet fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, I truly, I say to you, that this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept insisting, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they are all saying the same thing also. Now let's jump over to verse 53. Jesus uh, is betrayed. He's arrested. And verse 53 begins, They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders, the scribes, gathered together. Now Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself by the fire. Now, right after that, we have Jesus' trial. And then we'll pick it up in verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, Hey, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. Servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystander, this, this is one of them. But he again denied it. And after a while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man or what you're talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. <clears throat> it's a very heavy passage. Uh, notice that in order to really look at Peter's denial, we, we had to collect the verses from the entire passage. Why is that? As before, Mark intentionally intertwines these two stories of Peter's denial and Jesus' trial. Like literary sandwich, again. Uh, first, Peter's oath, never deny you, I'll never fall away, verses 29 to 30. Then Jesus' arrest and trial, verses 53 to 65, followed by Peter's vehement denial, 66 to 72. What's happening here is I believe Mark wants us to compare these two stories, to see the parallels between the witness of Peter and the witness of Jesus. Mark wants us to see that both Jesus and Peter are on trial. 
Peter is being questioned. Jesus is being questioned. Both are being asked to testify about Jesus. The main issue actually in chapter 14 is what does it mean to be a faithful and true witness of Jesus? The word witness or testify shows up seven times in Mark 14. It's a very important word in the New Testament. Uh, It's the Greek word martyros, from which we get the word martyr. It means to tell the truth as a witness to something in general or about Jesus in particular when you're in the New Testament. It means to tell the truth even if it costs you a lot, even your life. That passage really is challenging us to ask ourselves, do we have what it takes to be a true witness of Jesus? A person of integrity tells the truth about who we are, who Jesus is. Now, I'm going to look at, there's so much to talk about here. I'm going to look at this passage over the next two sermons. Today, this message, I have three main points. We'll look at the witness of Peter, the courtroom of life, and the healing of our failures. First, let's look at the witness of Peter. In chapter 14, we see that Jesus is being a very faithful and true witness as he stands before uh, the religious leaders, and we'll see it again when he stands before Pilate. Peter, though, is not. (laughs) It's really easy to see Peter's failure in the text. It's front and center for us. Uh, We're going to take a closer look at what happened, Peter, and the failure to be a true witness for Jesus. You see, I don't know if any of you have been in court before, uh, legal, any legal procedure in a court of law, and you know that before you give your testimony, they swear you in. You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Peter's failure as a witness actually begins in the passage we started with, Mark 14, 29, 31. Peter said to Jesus, even though all may fall away, I will not. Jesus said, truly I say to you this very night, you yourself will deny me. Peter kept insisting. On the point of death, I will not. You know what he's doing? He's taking the stand. I swear As a, here he is as a witness, you see. I swear I will not deny you. Peter willingly takes the witness stand, swears himself in, swears he's going to, upon his death, be faithful to Jesus. The other disciples may abandon Jesus, but he won't, even if it costs him his life. Now, in the next passage we looked at, when Jesus is arrested, we're told in verse 54, that only Peter followed at a safe distance. But let me tell you something. When it comes to being a witness for Jesus, there's no such thing as a safe distance. (laughs) To follow Jesus at all put Peter in great danger. Most likely, I assume, Peter felt the tug of his oath bearing down on him. Peter, listen, Peter tries to be a faithful witness, but he fails miserably, spectacularly. (laughs) He really does try. He intends to be. But when a servant girl asks Peter about Jesus three times, Peter responds three times, he doesn't know Jesus. Mm -mm. He even begins to curse and swear to the contrary. Seeing Peter warm himself, you know, we read the passage, he denied, I neither know what you're talking about. Rooster crows, servant girl again, this is one of them, he again denied it. Bystanders were also saying, you're one of them. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Wow. Now, i got to tell you, the, the NIV translation, if you have it, uh, 
translates that Peter began to call down curses on himself. Mm -mm. The translators are trying to be too nice to Peter. They are. The Greek text there has one word, anathematize, which means to curse or be cursed. And what's interesting, that word there, the verb is not reflexive, meaning myself. It's a transitive verb, which means it has to have an object. It has to have an object. Peter was cursing someone or something in order to save his own skin. And he wasn't cursing, if he wasn't cursing himself, who was he cursing? He was cursing Jesus. He was cursing Jesus. The leader of the Christian church. Why would he curse Jesus? To prove he wasn't a disciple. How are you going to do that? You curse him. No true disciple would curse his master. Peter saved his own skin. But he had to curse Jesus to do it. Look, this is a terrible, personal, public betrayal of Jesus and a spectacular failure in Peter's attempt to be a true witness. It really is. I mean, the minute the rooster crows, the horror of what Peter has done descends on him like an avalanche. It, it, it absolutely broke him. He doesn't just weep. He, he falls apart. What are we supposed to learn from this? Three things. Mark it well. First thing we learn from Peter is that ordinary life is our courtroom. We're just out by the fire in the courtyard talking to somebody. We're just at the grocery store or on the job or... It's life. He's just out by the courtyard. Ordinary life is a trial where we're called upon to be a faithful witness for Jesus, to tell the truth about Jesus. And in ordinary life, then, our integrity is on trial, really. Will we speak up? for the truth, no matter what it costs? Will we identify with Jesus publicly? It's in ordinary life that our integrity, our ability to be a faithful witness is on trial, and it's tested, just like it was for Peter. You can have all kinds of great intentions. I love Jesus. I'm fully committed. Oh, wait a second. I'm not going to say anything about that. Listen to me. Peter (laughs) had more reason than anyone to be faithful, be a faithful witness. Are you kidding me? He made a promise. He swore to Jesus face to face he would not deny him. How can you get any stronger accountability than that running through your system? You can't. He made a promise, Jesus, and being face to face with Jesus was some serious accountability and motivation to keep your word. Peter had more reason and tried harder than anyone to be a faithful witness, and listen to me, he failed miserably. And Peter failed for the same reason we do. We're basically cowards. Save our skin. We would rather be silent, kind of incognito, so that nobody gives us any flack or judge us or reject us. We don't want anybody to know who we really are, because if they did, you see, then, oh, they would expect us to walk the talk. Whoa. 
They might then conclude we're hypocrites. None of us wants to be judged. We still want the approval of others to feel good about ourselves. And we'll try to save our own skin. We're basically cowards, really. Myself included. This message really convicted me. But we're not going to stop there today. We need to move quickly, quickly on to the next point, which is the third thing we learn from Peter is that God can heal us of our failures to be his witness. What we understand here is Peter did eventually become a faithful and true witness that he wasn't here. The passage actually bears witness to the fact that Peter was healed. You see, the Gospels are oral histories passed down by the eyewitnesses themselves to the apostles, to the writers of the New Testament. For decades, these eyewitnesses who lived, moved during Jesus' time, and these eyewitnesses told their stories of what happened to them in their encounters with Jesus, and they told us in great detail. People like Bartimaeus, Nicodemus, Mary and Martha, Zacchaeus, the lepers, the blind, the lame, the demon-possessed, all of whom Jesus healed. They all passed down their stories in the written record of these Gospels. And in addition, of course, the 12 disciples told, passed down what they saw and heard and witnessed. But if you remember, when we began studying the Gospel of Mark, I mentioned that there's evidence that this gospel, Mark's gospel, is actually Peter's eyewitness testimony. We know from the New Testament and other writings that Mark was a disciple of Jesus and he was a companion of Peter. And in his gospel, Mark mentions Peter more than any of the other gospels. There's never anything that happens when Peter's not present in Mark's gospel. Peter's always there, collectively or individually. <clears throat> and you see, there are little details throughout the text that only Peter would have known who was there. Like verse 66, where we're told Peter was below in the courtyard when Jesus was brought into Jerusalem. Well, being below the courtyard is a detail that is unnecessary, really, to advance the plot. It's just, a, it's just a side detail. It's where he ended up. Why would you include it? The details are there because they are being remembered. Here's what I did. Here's where I was. Here's what I said. As a result, Mark is the only gospel where we learn that Jesus' trial took place on the second level. What this means is that the Gospel of Mark is testimony that Peter was healed. He, he was <laughs> changed. After all this was over, Peter was so deeply healed that he became one of the leading eyewitnesses. He publicly testified for decades what Jesus did for him by the grace of God. For instance, when we come to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, uh, people are listening to Peter and John. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood they were uneducated, untrained men and were amazed. They began to recognize, haven't been with, they were with Jesus. Or keep going, Acts 4, 18 to 20. When they had summoned them, they commanded them not to, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. There's a witness. And also, during the persecution of Christians that was being ramped up during the first century in the time of Nero, around 65 AD, when Peter and the apostles were still alive, it, it really became fatal to admit you were a Christian. So many Christians died for their faith during that period. 
And when the authorities did finally come after Peter, there's written testimony of those who were there who heard him say, take me, without any hesitation. It's extremely astonishing, you see. Think about it. The foundational documents of the Christian church, the Gospels, show that the greatest leader in the Christian church was an enormous failure who cursed his master. No other culture or religion would have ever allowed Peter to be a leader. Somebody who did that. But several days later, after all of this, and something happened in Peter's life. It healed him. Equipped him to be the leader he could never be on his own. We're going to talk about more about that next time in part two of this, but in John chapter 21, when the risen Christ met Jesus, met, met Peter at another fire on a beach, he um, asked Peter three questions, making him painfully retrace his threefold denial. Jesus asked him, uh, do you love me more than these? Well, first you've got to ask yourself, what do these mean? More than what? What these was Jesus referring to? Well, if you remember Peter's oath to Jesus, he actually says, I'm more committed to you, Jesus, than all these other disciples. Nobody's more sold out to you than me. A short time later, Peter denied him three times and cursed him. Now Jesus is asking him around this fire, Peter, are you still going to tell me that you love me more than anybody else? You know what Peter does? I imagine he's crushed in a repentant heart. Are you, are you more sold out? You're a better man than these other guys? Jesus really is asking Peter to repent of his threefold failure to keep his commitment by acknowledging three times that he loves Jesus in spite of his colossal failure. And three times, Peter doesn't defend himself, doesn't explain his failure, which we like to do when somebody accuses us, of, challenges us. We, we run right, make our case. Here it is. Why I'm a good person. I'm not a failure like you're making me out to. He didn't do any of that. <laughs> Basically, what he's saying is, Lord, no, Lord, I, I don't love you more than these I just love you. There we go. Don't tell me how committed you are. Just tell me that you love me. And every, time, every single time, Jesus leads him to repentance. Do you love me? He didn't say, why did you do that? No. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Are you still going to say you're you do love and more committed to me than these? No. I just love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Lead my church. Out of that failure, you become my faithful true witness. It's a lesson for all of us, really, about failure. See, listen, uh, what struck me as we bring it down to us, you see, in a shame-based culture, that would have never happened. Mm -mm. But 
with Jesus, Peter's failure was plunged into God's amazing grace-based kingdom. Don't ever forget that. And that's what we're going to continue to talk about next time, how God's grace healed Peter of his failure to become a faithful and true ruins, and how he can heal us. I know what it's like. One of the hardest things for a Christian to learn is how to live by the grace-based culture that Jesus makes possible. Most of us grew up in and may still be in a shame-based culture. Sad. And every failure leaves us with guilt-ridden shame. We beat ourselves up over and over. Others may start to judge us, look down on us, and it gets worse. But if we understand the gospel, believing in Jesus frees us from a shame-based culture and thinking. Why? Because we're receiving a grace-based one in Jesus. It's not based on what we do, how good we are. If we were able to fulfill all our commitments, come to church every single Sunday, I couldn't do it. Do you love Jesus? It's not based on the things we've done. The gospel says we, or we haven't done. It's based on what Jesus did on our behalf. Believing in him, uh, he took our, our sins on himself, died on the cross, satisfied the righteous judgment of God. I, I've talked to many people over the years about the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers simply by believing in him, the son of God. And many have said they don't believe it. I said, why? It's too easy. (laughs) It's too easy. Why would God give it to me freely? I don't deserve it. They know that. I've got to prove myself. I've got to do something that makes it, that shows that I'm worth it, what he did. No, you don't. He died on the cross while we were still sinners. <laughs> Sadly, this is the saddest thing for me. Our shame-based culture and thinking can actually keep us from humbling ourselves and receiving God's gift of forgiveness and eternal life. But I invite you, if you're here today and you've never believed in Jesus, be your Savior, I invite you to be plunged into God's grace. Plunge yourself. Repent of the thinking that you can save yourself. Somehow you're never going to be a failure. Uh, you're, You're a Christian and you're a good person. Repent of that thinking. Repent of the thinking like Peter. You're good enough. You're better than all these other professing people. Repent of living under the condemnation you've put yourself in or others have and believe in Jesus and you'll receive freedom, grace, the gift of eternal life. Hope you can keep with us next week as we continue these thoughts. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the grace that you've given us, that Jesus came to give us new life and deliver us from our sin, our guilt, and our shame. We know we're not worthy, Lord. We're sinners, every single one of us. Even our righteousness before you is like a filthy rag. None of it merits your (laughs) approval of us. We need Jesus. Thank you that you gave us his righteousness to stand approved and justified before you. Father, we ask you to help us recognize the ways we're all still prone to think and behave according to shame. Please lead us to live by faith in the grace you've given us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray in his name. Amen.